Now, in our last video, we discussed triglycerides as storage lipids. That is basically um, three fatty acids that are esterified to the alcohol groups of glycerol. Well, in this video, we're going to explore structural lipids that are part of membrane lipids, basically. And we could classify membrane lipids in general as phospholipids, glycolipids, or archaea ether lipids. And we're going to really focus on phospholipids and glycolipids. And in general, if we take a look at a general feature of biological membrane, we'll notice that it's a double layer. Right? Oops. Um what you have is basically a double layer of lipid that acts as a barrier for the passage of molecules across it. And in a later section, we'll learn about membrane proteins that help faci facilitate the diffusion of molecules across the lipid bilayer. But if we take a look at the structure of glycerophospholipid and sphingolipids, we'll notice that they're amphipathic, amphipathic molecules. They have both polar and nonpolar head groups, right? You have the phosphate groups, the phosphate groups, and hence they're known as phospholipids, right? And then they could be, um, they could have charged groups at either of the two carbons. And within, within the, you know, within a lipid bilayer, what you have is the hydrophobic interactions will predominate between hydro phobic fatty acids, while the hydrophilic interactions will predominate with the aqueous environment on either side of the bilayer. And this is typically the, you know, polar charged hedge groups will be, you know, on either side of the lipid bilayer. And glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids are two major components of the lipid bilayers. But we'll start by taking a look at glycerophospholipids. And if you take a look at the hydrophobic region, it's composed really of two different fatty acids. Change that. It's composed of two different fatty acids. And those two fatty acids are joined to the glycerol via carbons one and two, right? They're joined to, you know, a phosphoglycerol really via carbons one and two. And here's carbons one and two. And then you have a highly charged polar head group, which is basically the phosphate, right? And there's a highly charged polar head group that's attached to carbon three via a phosphodiester linkage. So now you have this phosphodiester linkage, which will be linked to um, a polar charged head group. This is one example. It could be as simple as a hydrogen atom, right? So they differ by that connection on either um, at the phosphodiester linkage, right? Uh, carbons one and two, um, the most common really, um, the most common fatty acids that are carbon two are unsaturated carbon eighteen or carbon twenty fatty acids and carbon 1, the most common typically are carbon 16 and carbon 18 saturated fatty acids, such as palmitic acid being a carbon 16 saturated or seric acid be having 18 carbons. And if you take a look at carbon 2, they're unsaturated. So they have pi bonds within that fatty acid. And if you recall, you can't really rotate easily around pi bonds. It forms cis and trans isomers. And that's what would give glycerophospholipids this rigid bend at the second carbon. Okay, well, glycerophospholipids, we're, we're still talking about glycerophospholipids, right? You have the glycerol, you have uh, ester linkage at carbon 2, which is typically an unsaturated fatty acid, and then you have an ester linkage at carbon 1, which is typically a saturated fatty acid that's either 16 or 18 carbons long. Um, how do I know that this is carbon 1? Well, car the phosphate group is at carbon 3, right? And then you have a phosphodiester linkage, right, um, to a polar head group. Right, or charged hedge group. If it's simply hydrogen, then that is known as 
phosphatidid phosphatidic acid and glycerophospholipids are really named as derivative of phosphatidic acid which is basically the parent compound and if we take a look at the different names all right so you have the phosphate group and you have different groups attached to this phosphate group if it's a hydrogen that is the parent compound known as phosphatidic acid but it could also be um and then every other name is really a derivative of it. If it's connected to an ethyl group, right? Ethyl group, and you have an amine, then the name is known as phosphatidyl ethanolamine, right? You have an ethyl attached to an amine. The amine has three hydrogen attached to it, but instead of three hydrogens, if what you have is three methyl groups, then that's known as a choline. Then we have phosphatidyl choline. It could also be connected to a serine, then we have phosphatidyl serine, or phosphatidyl inositol. Right? We could have phosphatidyl glycerol. But again, the phosphatidyl is simply the parent compound. Um, and instead of H, we have something else. Right? So this in general is known as phosphatidic acid. And that's an example of a glycerophospholipid. Well, those specific bind, bonds within glycerophospholipids can be hydrolyzed by enzymes known as phospholipases. And there is three different types of, or I mean four different types of phospholipases. One known as 5-phospholipase A2 that's going to cleave the ester linkage at carbon 2, right? It's a hydrolysis reaction, so water comes in and then you have an alcohol group, right? and the carboxylate the fatty acid basically is generated right and then we have phospholipase a that cleaves the ester linkage at carbon two i mean at carbon one and then the other two are known as phospholipase c and phospholipase d phospholipase d cleaves after that phosphodiester linkage and it generates the head group right and the head group attached to the phosphate could be any one of those molecules, right? Whereas phospholipase C cleaves the phosphate as well, right? And you end up with an alcohol at carbon 3. And the identity of fatty acids at different carbons within glycerophospholipids was identified by, you know, utilizing the enzymes phospholipases. So another component of the lipid bilayer is sphingolipids, and we're going to take a look at sphingolipids. And they're both, again, example of phospholipids, right? You have the phosphate group at carbon 3. But they also differ in that sphingolipids are actually derivatives of a ceramide, and ceramides are components of a sphingosine and hence the, the name sphingolipids but if we take a look at a sphingosine um, if you recall when we talked about amino acids think about this as the amino group the alpha carbon alpha beta alcohol group then we're talking about a serine residue so sphingosine is sort of a derivative of a serine residue on one end and you know, an unsaturated palmitic acid on another end, right? That's one way to think about it. And then the fatty acid residues are attached to the amine at carbon 2. Another way to look at sphingosines, they're not, um, we don't have a glycerol as the backbone, but we could take a look at those three carbons as being similar to the carbons of glycerol, right? We have one group attached to carbon 1, another group attached to carbon 2, and another group attached to carbon 3, right? This overall structure is sphingosine. Now, sphingolipids are... Um, sphingolipids are all derivatives of a ceramide, and in the ceramide, you have a fatty acid that is linked at via an amide bond to the 
A minor carbon two, right? So that's one easy way to differentiate between glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids is the presence of an amide bond at carbon two. Now there are three different classes of sphingolipids, and again they're all derivatives of ceramides, but they differ in their head group. And now the head group is basically where the alcohol group is, right? We're gonna take a look at sphingomyelins, we're gonna take a look at cerebrocytes and gangliosides. Cerebrocytes and gangliosides are example of sphingolipids that really belong to glycolipids, because instead of the alcohol group, what we have is um, an oligosaccharide, a mono or oligosaccharide. Cerebrocytes typically have a single sugar attached to it, whereas gangliosides have more complex sugars. Well, if we take a look at sphingomyelins, they contain a phosphocholine head group or a phosphoethylenamide. Okay, and the difference between phosphocholine, which has three methyls attached to it, versus a phosphoethylamine is that those are simply hydrogens, right? And the fatty acid is typically a palmitate residue. So they're classified as phospholipids because we still have the phosphate group, right? Notice it's not attached to the back. It's not part of a glycerol, right? And you could differentiate a phosphocholine head group as part of a sphingolipid versus a glycerophospholipid really by the amide bond at carbon 2, right? The amide bond at carbon 2 is an easy way to differentiate between sphingolipids and glycerophospholipids. Okay, well, they're present in the plasma membrane of animal cells and really predominate in myelins. They predominate um, in myelin's sheet. So they surround and insulate um, some neurons, and hence the name, sphingomyelins. Okay, I just wanted to go back for a second to help differentiate. You're always going to have an amide bond versus right here at the second carbon, you'll have the ester linkage. Because glycerophospholipids at the third carbon, where you have the phosphate, you could have a number of different groups, right? So you could have a phosphocholine group, right? But you could differentiate between both by taking a look at the amide linkage. Okay, so another type of um, sphingolipids that are again derivatives of ceramides are um, gangliosides and those are um, the most complex sphingolipids. They're linked to oligosaccharides as part of their head groups and they tend to have one or more an acetyl neuramic acid which is shown um, right here in red, right? Um, and it is negatively charged at pH 7. So it gives the entire gangliosides, you know, a negative charge at pH 7. And then we have different types um, of gangliosides. And um, one example is the terms we see right here as GM1, GM2, and GM3. Um, G, can we actually highlight? All right, so without any of this, okay, whatever I'm highlighting without it, that would be an example of a GM3. It's composed of the ceramide where you have steric acid at carbon two, and then the disaccharide glucose and galactose linked to the N-acetyl neuramic acid. An example of G3 is that it's also linked to an acetyl galactosamine. An example of G1 is it's also linked to D-galactose. So GM3 is a disaccharide linked to an acetyl neuramic acid. GM2 
2 is this trisaccharide, GM1 is a tetrasaccharide, but all those are different types of gangliosides, but there are hundreds of different known gangliosides, and they're typically components of cell surface membranes. It's about 6% in brain lipids, right? So you don't have to know the details of them, that's just um, gangliosides in general. You don't have to memorize what GM1, GM2, and GM3 is, just the general components. One of the other types of sphingolipids we have said are ceramides or cerebrocytes that are derivatives of ceramides where cerebrocytes, right? We could have sphingomyelin, which we discussed, cerebrocytes and gangliocytes. Cerebrocytes are similar to gangliocytes, except they have only a single sugar link to the hatch group. It's only a single sugar. It's typically um, glucose in the plasma membrane of cells that are um, non in non neuro in you know in tissues that are not part of the neural. Whereas it's typically galactose in cells um, found in neural tissues. Okay, so those are the different types. Okay, so that's an example of a glycolipid, right? Notice we don't have the phosphate groups. So sphingolipids are either glycolipids or phospholipids. 